We all watch space launches from companies like SpaceX and the like, and marvel at the geniuses who have managed incredibly complex technology to get human beings into space. But you know what? We can all drive a little bit of space technology ourselves. In fact, it might be in your garage right now. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So this episode is inspired by Sandy Monroe by way of solving the money problem. <laughs> I don't wanna put any clips in this in my video itself, so I'm gonna put the link of the solving the money problem in the description because I believe the original Sandy Monroe was behind a paywall and I don't wanna mess with trademark violations or anything like that. But anyway, you can check out the video, it's quite useful and it will go into some detail because Sandy, uh, apparently Monroe and Associates, when they break down a car, they literally break it down to the microscopic level. I did not realize that until this video. They actually have uh, microscopic views of like the different types of magnetic material in a standard magnet versus what Tesla is doing. So anyway, that is just absolutely incredible stuff. And I'll see if I can find a picture someplace that has a little bit more public domain, or maybe by fair use, I can just throw it up for a couple of seconds. But anyway, what it made me think about was the fact that Tesla has more to do with a space technology company than it does with other automotive manufacturers. So today I'm not gonna talk about solar or energy or anything like that. I'm just gonna talk about their automobiles, but these automobiles are kind of like spacecraft for the people, which was what of course inspired the title and also the thumbnail. And that is now a t-shirt on our merch store. So in case you wanna own that thumbnail and have it for yourself, you can get it on a t-shirt, etc. So let's break down a little bit what I'm talking about here. I wanna put it into three categories. There's materials, there's software and there's safety. So let's start with materials because that's what Monroe was talking about in his particular breakdown of that. When you look inside a Tesla in great detail, what's inside the Tesla is not like what's inside other cars. I mean, even to the aluminum body panels and stuff, the aluminum that they are using is some sort of mystery aluminum, and that's not all the car itself, but that's a lot of pieces of the car. And so they've clearly got material scientists, chemists, who are working on creating different materials, whatever they need. I mean, basically they're saying, don't worry about what everybody else has done, make something new if you need to. And if you think about that, this is what aerospace companies do. This is not what automobile companies do. Automobile companies go, hey, what did aerospace companies do a decade ago? Oh, that's some pretty cool technology. Maybe we can use it in our you know, automobiles. But if you think back to like the 1950s and 60s, when you think about like the X-15, uh, X-15 and uh, the SR-71, the Blackbird, those are two really interesting um, uses of material science where they had to invent new materials material like Inconel X and uh, the, the titanium, of course, which is not a new material, but they had to figure out how to actually utilize it. So all of that kind of stuff, they had to basically create these new materials with new properties to go at the ridiculous speeds they're going. And what you see is that same sort of thought process going on from Tesla. Tesla doesn't just go like, oh yeah, you know, somebody else already invented this, so we'll utilize their, you know, whatever stainless steel. And you see this with SpaceX, of course, as well, right? The, the Starship, in fact, serial number 15, which we are leaving, <laughs> to go to see soon. I'm super excited about that. But anyway, that is made out of a new stainless steel material that is not, it's a mystery one. Nobody knows exactly what the ingredients are in it. So it's a very new material that they developed themselves that has better properties. It has, you know, lighter, it's lighter weight because it's stronger so they can use less of it. And apparently it behaves better at cryogenic and at uh, high temperatures. So, you know, so they didn't just go like, oh, somebody else made this. They're thinking like an aerospace company and they're creating new material, but that thought thought process, that sort of first principles, take it from the ground up. What do you need to make this work well? Would a magnet work better if it had a more homogeneous material as opposed to one that was a little more bubbly and everything on a microscopic level? If so, then yeah, go ahead and go for it. Like, try this stuff out. Spend millions of dollars in research trying to come up with the perfect material because when you do, you are going to outcompete the competition. You're gonna crush them. So thinking about properties, material properties and everything is super important and the ability and the will to utilize new materials all throughout the car. The shroud around the motor, for example, has different properties than standard materials, as Monroe talks about, which is kind of crazy, right? You wouldn't think the shroud around the motor would have anything to do with the performance of the motor itself, but apparently it has more reflective 
performance capabilities so it allows the motor to run more efficiently. I don't know all of that stuff. I'm not a material scientist, but anyway, it sounds fascinating. And just the fact that they're willing to, you know, look at what's normally a hunk of metal, which nobody would even think about. They just cast it the same way everybody else did. Obviously, they are thinking about this stuff. When you get to the, the Gigapress and the materials that they're using in the Gigapress, and by the way, if you haven't seen that video, check it out up here. It seems to be very, very popular. So hopefully you have checked it out, but if not, definitely check it out after you watch this video. But anyway, they're not just thinking about like a Gigapress, which is this giant machine to cast things, but they're thinking about different forms of aluminum that operate well under high pressures and very, very fast flow and can solidify quickly and have a good granular structure, etc., etc. So they're doing material science work and they're figuring out how to cast entire portions of the automobile as one unit and eventually I think the entire thing is going to be one unit. So anyway, they're constantly thinking about material science. They're also thinking about the strength and of course that has to do with materials, but there's specifically the strength of the materials. A lot of that has to do with the underbody and the, you know, the safety aspects of the car, but there's also just the fact that they are willing to create a whole new thing which is a structural battery pack with the 4680 battery cells that they talked about on battery day where they basically are taking a tray, they're filling it with the batteries, and then they're putting an epoxy, which has a rigidity to it, and again, material science, and they're creating out of that kind of a box that has an incredible structural rigidity, which means that you don't have to add trusses or anything like that. You've just got the battery itself. That compartment acts as the middle section of the car. So strength is hugely important, as is consistency, because of course, if you're casting things over and over again as one piece, as opposed to hundreds of little pieces, you have a more consistent part. All of this, of course, leads to longevity. And longevity is, uh, Tesla really talks about very seriously that their car should be able to last 10 years. And I'm not talking about 10 years and it's got holes in it and it's barely working and stuff anymore. They're talking about 10 years basically like new. And I think that's even if it's being utilized at a very, very, a uh, high percentage of time, so like a robo taxi or something, right? And the new versions that have the 4680 battery cells should have battery chemistry that works up to the level of the rest of it. And speaking of chemistry and materials properties, working on new battery chemistry is very important too. So of course you can compare all of this to the SpaceX technology. And speaking of that, think about how incredible it is that Crew 2, which is the mission that's leaving on uh, April 23rd, it's supposed to at least, which is my son's birthday, by the way. So <laughs> here's hoping it takes off on that day. But anyway, it has a used booster and a used crew capsule. So both of the main parts, the second stage, of course, is not used because they, they it burns up in the atmosphere when it comes down. But both of the main components, the main booster and the crew capsule, are reused. And this is the first time in human spaceflight history that that has ever happened. That is an absolutely incredible achievement. And for NASA to go for it, NASA, who is so conservative, especially when it comes to human-rated spaceflight, and with human-rated spaceflight, I'm totally on board with that. Sometimes I feel like they're a little too conservative. But when you're talking about the safety of human beings, I absolutely agree with conservatism. So if they are with SpaceX on this in terms of reutilizing these components, that is absolutely huge. That means that they really, truly understand. They don't believe. They have looked at the data and they've looked at the science and they can see that these spacecraft are safe. And that is incredible. And I know Tesla is a different company, but it's run by the same person and they actually share a lot of brain power between the two of them. So you are literally getting some of the technology when you buy a Tesla that was being utilized or is being utilized in SpaceX spacecraft like the Falcon 9 or eventually with the Cybertruck, you're going to be probably utilizing some of the stuff that they've developed with the Starship, which is just amazing like the stainless steel exoskeleton materials. And finally, on the materials front is the interaction aspect of it. So nothing exists in a vacuum in an automobile or a spacecraft. All of these parts have to interact with each other and they have to work well with each other. So that is also a huge component. And again, designing chemistry and designing parts and designing uh, manufacturing techniques to make them and make them inexpensively and make them consistently and, and make them interact properly with each other, all of that is huge. So I guess the short way around that is to just say never let what's happened before stand in the way of doing something new. And now let's turn to software. I'm not going to spend a massive amount of time on this because I've got a lot of videos on that so you can watch it in much more detail. But let's think about a couple of aspects of software that relate between SpaceX and Tesla. Number one is the guidance software, which would be in terms of the rocket ship, of course, the thing that makes it go up into the air and not crash and spin around and all of that kind of stuff, right? So it gets it into space, into orbit, in the right orbit, etc., etc. And with their satellites, with Star 
Starlink and everything, it gets the Starlink satellites into orbit and keeps them all from crashing into each other and crashing into other satellites. So that's the guidance. The equivalent of that with a Tesla, of course, is autopilot or either the basic level, which is just kind of lane assist, which keeps you in the lane and keeps you away from other cars. Or, you know, at the higher end level, when we're talking about the full self-driving beta and everything, something that drives at a level that is at least human level at this point and sounds like it's getting beyond human level. It's getting to be better than humans driving. So that sort of synergy between the two of them, oh, I can't believe I just said synergy. I hate that word. But anyway, but you've got this, you've got the two companies that are working out the same sort of principles. They are trying to guide a very complex, very heavy, very fast moving object, obviously a rocket much, much faster uh, than a car, but they're talking about guiding these things to very, very precise um, positions and velocities, etc. right? Because not only does SpaceX have to get these things into orbit, but they have to land the boosters and eventually they have to land the, the crew cabins of the capsules as well. So they have to be very exact with all of this navigation and everything. And then of course there's the control and management software. Now this is not nearly as sexy as the, you know, the full self-driving kind of stuff, but you've got to control the thermal aspects of the batteries and the car itself and the spacecraft. You've got to control the energy flow. You've got to control the systems like pumps and electric transmission of things between different places, etc., etc. So again, in the rocket, you've got a whole bunch of systems systems that have to be controlled and managed because you can't have a turbo pump spinning too fast and putting too much fuel into the, or fuel or oxidizer, either one of those, into the combustion chamber or you have problems. So you've got to control all of these things. You've got to be looking at the thermal management of all of this stuff. You've got to be cooling all of these things, et cetera, et cetera. And in a car, obviously you have thermal management of the humans inside the car itself, but you've also critically got thermal management and energy control over the batteries. The batteries have to release energy very, very rapidly when you hit the, you know, the accelerator pedal. When you're like, you know, when you do that like zero to 60 in, in four seconds or something, that, there's a lot of technology behind that. Not only do the motors have to work well, but the electrical flow has to happen and the batteries will heat up really fast as all of those electrons go flying out of the batteries. So you've got to cool it. So there's all sorts of management and control that's going on under the hood, ha <laughs> ha. But anyway, you know, there's all of this stuff that's happening that's, that we don't really think about a lot, but the car does not drive well if all of this stuff is not working right. And again, Tesla has developed all of this stuff themselves. They've created all of these pieces so that it works. And this is one of the reasons why, like when Monroe, he recently reviewed the uh, ID4, the Volkswagen ID4, and he was really not pleased with it and the driving experience. And also the UI and the UX. I haven't really talked about that too much yet, and I think I should do a whole video on that. But Tesla's user interface and user experience is leaps and bounds above any other electric car that I've seen. So all of this stuff from the way under the hood stuff that nobody really notices, but is critical to making the car drive well and drive quickly and drive fun, uh, all the way up to how you interact with the vehicle. All of those things are being thought about in an original way with Tesla, which is incredible. And finally, let's just touch on safety. So obviously SpaceX is the only human rated US launch service at this point, and only the third, there's Russia and there's China. <laughs> so there's only three, two of them are countries, and one of them is SpaceX, which is, has human rated spacecraft at this point. And that of course says a huge amount about SpaceX and their incredible drive and their incredible focus to be able to make this happen because NASA, again, with human rated stuff, they are incredibly conservative. So it's not like they're just giving SpaceX a free pass. They actually made them work harder than Boeing historically. And then of course you've got what I just did a video on, which is the, the safety ratings of Tesla automobiles. Not just their full self-driving, but their crash worthiness. They are the safest cars. The Model 3, Model Y are the safest cars. And I expect the, the Cybertruck will actually probably outdo both of them because it's so freaking big that it's going to be really hard to damage that truck. But anyway, all of those vehicles are like the safest cars on the road. And of course you've got the Model S and the Model X as well. But anyway, Anyway, Tesla's cars are the safest fleet of cars without a doubt. Like all of their, their cars that they've produced, maybe not the Roadster, the original one, but all of the other ones are the safest cars that have ever been produced in terms of a fleet and generally speaking in terms of each individual car. So again, with SpaceX, you see that they are so safe and so reliable that NASA is allowing them to relaunch a booster and relaunch a crew capsule on this Crew-2 mission. And so that just shows how amazingly safe these vehicles are. And of course with Tesla's, not just the crash test, but real world crashes that have happened have shown 
that Teslas are incredibly safe and people are able to walk away or survive horrific crashes that probably would have killed them in almost any other vehicle. So again, don't knock the importance of safety. It's huge. And finally, we have the Roadster 2, which will have real rockets in it. So in terms of having rockets for the people, there you go. You literally do. It's not just rocket science and thinking about it, but you will have the ability, if you have a couple hundred thousand dollars, to purchase a car with a rocket in it. Now, of course, these are cold gas thrusters, which basically means just a really, really big can of compressed air. And it's basically like a soda can, right? You open it up and it goes like that. So it's that kind of thing. It's, it's a, a COPV or something like that like that. I assume a carbon, uh, so carbon overwrap pressure vessel, right? Anyway, but it's it's just gonna be a bottle and they'll pump air into it, but then when you wanna take off and go like really fast, it'll shoot that air out the back, which is a monopropellant rocket, and that will make the, the Roadster go zero to 60, some people say in under one second potentially, which is ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, but it could also have them on the sides too, so as you're making a corner, they can shoot out the sides and allow you to make corners at ridiculous um, you know angles that no car without rocket could possibly do. It's kind of a Batman sort of thing, so it's incredible. So if you want an actual rocket for the people, there you go. It's an expensive one, but by 2022 or so, you should be able to order a rocket for your very own. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and informative. If you did, definitely like it so other people can find it, and of course, subscribe for more of this. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. You all are wonderful. Since the last video, I've got a couple of new patrons. Let me just check right here. We have Terrence Green, and Dale Gilbert. Thank you both so much for your support, and if you want to join the team, just check out the link in the description. And as I talked about before, don't forget about our merch store, which now has Rockets for the People t-shirts, as well as Don't Mess with Tesla, and many other t-shirts and mugs and tumblers, etc., etc. So check it out and help out the channel. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how clicking on a link and going shopping helps the channel. Thank you. And as always, please feel free to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.